On Saturday, Russia's Sevastopol naval base was struck. Plumes of smoke were seen rising. This was the second attack in less than a month. In terms of damage, the attack may not be seeming very significant, but it was an especially crucial one. Let me tell you why. The attack involved a single drone, just one drone. Secondly, the drone flew over a very sensitive military site. So the question is, how was a drone able to evade Russian warfare defences, especially flying right over a crucial naval base? Sevastopol is not alone, in fact. Such attacks have happened at Russia's Sakai military base, the one in western Crimea, and on Russia's ships in the Black Sea. Ukraine has not confirmed or denied that it was behind these attacks, but by the looks of it, these were the works of kamikaze drones. Drones that were small enough to sneak through the Russian air defense and had explosives strapped onto them. The, explosive, the explosions were small, but caused significant damage and indication of how drone warfare is changing the Russia-Ukraine war. This week, the conflict is nearing the six-month mark. In the beginning, it was about capturing cities, holding on to territories and proving which army was truly more powerful. But nearly 180 days later, the nature of this war has shifted. And now it is about attacking strategically using drones. These unmanned aerial vehicles are hitting targets behind the enemy lines, changing the way this conflict is playing out. So what are these drones? Ukraine's military is primarily using this one, the Turkish Beraktar TB2. It is about the size of a small plane. The Beraktar has cameras on board and is armed with laser-guided bombs. In fact, it was so successful in the Ukraine war that countries are lining up to acquire this drone. The company that manufactures it says the Beraktar now has a three-year waiting list. Russia, on the other hand, uses the Orlan 10. It is not as fancy as the Beraktar. It is smaller, but is more basic. But the drones do carry cameras and small bombs. For both sides, drones are very effective. They are used to locate enemy targets and especially stretch the use of the forces. For Ukraine, this is a huge advantage. Earlier, if you wanted to hit the enemy, you needed to send out a unit. You could even lose some troops in that process. And now you can just send out a drone. The worst case scenario, you would end up losing the drone. But this is not just any loss. It's an expensive one. One Beraktar drone costs around $2 million. Since the beginning of the war, several Beraktar drones have been taken out by Russia. Given the fact that they are slow, this makes it easy to shoot them down. So what is the alternative? Other cheaper commercial drones. Both Russia and Ukraine are using more and more non-military drones. For Kiev, the go-to option is DJI Mavic 3. Maximum flying distance, 30 kilometers. The DJI Mavic 3, in fact, uh, for flying time, it's around 46 minutes. These commercial drones can be fitted with bombs as well. But they are mostly used to spot enemy targets or to direct attacks. They are like any army's eyes in the sky. But the DJI has now stopped supplying drones to Ukraine. Kiev says they have around 6,000 of them left. Which brings us to the question, who is now supplying the drones? We told you about the Beraktar drones. Turkey has been supplying them to Ukraine. The US is also supplying Ukraine with the kamikaze drones. Ukraine has also launched a crowdfunding drive to buy 200 military drones, the ones that could have been used in the recent attacks. As for Russia, reports suggesting it is buying the Shahid military drones from Iran. So drones are changing the course of the war, but how is each side defending itself against these attacks? The answer is electronic warfare systems. They can locate, disrupt and jam electronic and GPS signals from drones. Russia is using online systems like Aeroscope, 
What it does is disrupt communication between the drone and the operators. And this makes the drone crash or return. It also uses the Stupor rifle. This shoots electromagnetic fuels in the sky that prevent drones from navigating the GPS. And with me on the broadcast this minute is Edward P. Joseph from Washington, D.C. He is a part of the faculty of the John Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies. Thanks very much for being here with us on the broadcast, Edward. Uh, if you can start off by sharing your assessment of how significant the use of these drones really is in the Russia-Ukraine war and how it's changing the dynamics of this conflict. <laughs> Drones have been a significant part of this conflict from the outset. Uh, there, there's simply no doubt about that. It's the, the recent use in Crimea, uh, which has prompted some surprise, uh, particularly from the Russian side, about the extent and the audacity of the Ukrainian side. But drones have been a significant part of this. And what's so significant here politically is, as your report mentioned, that Turkey is a major supplier of drones to Ukraine, and Turkey at the same time maintains this relationship with Russia. Uh, it even has brokered talks, peace talks, uh, between the two sides, hosting them even in Turkey. So it, it's a, a sign, interestingly, politically, that a country, a major country like Turkey, can both uh, supply critical weaponry, lethal weaponry in some cases, drones to Ukraine, and at the same time maintain an open relationship with Russia. And that should be a message, of course, to other major countries that have not taken sides on this question of this unprovoked Russian invasion of Ukraine. But tactically, operationally, there's no question drones are a significant part of the conflict. Please. Right, and who, who is supplying these drones to either side is also a significant aspect. Like we said, uh, Turkey has been supplying Ukraine with the Beraktar drones. The U.S. also supplying Ukraine uh, with the Kamikaze drones. As for Russia, uh, reports suggesting that it has been buying drones from Iran, but not much is known on that front. But we do know that uh, both Russia and Iran have been expanding their drone capabilities. It, it, that's right. And there was uh, speculation by the visit uh, to Iran recently that uh, uh, by senior Russian officials that that this would be the the core uh, purpose of that visit would be uh, that Iran would uh, supply uh, drones to Russia. Of course, this is tied up with uh, other sensitivities and objectives of Iran, notably its negotiations uh, indirectly with the United States to lift sanctions, that is to rejoin the Iran nuclear deal. The other uh, major speculation, of course, is that China might supply drones uh, to Russia, but it has not done that so far, is, is to our knowledge, even in the wake of the visit by Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan, uh, which some thought uh, in that case, China would provide uh, drones to Russia, but that does not seem to have been the case. Uh, and so uh, Russia is, as we see, pressed, uh, both in terms of quantity and the quality of its technology and the use of its drone warfare, and also, as your report indicated, in its defenses, its inability to defend against the drones that Ukraine has used against Russian uh, military targets. Please. Everett P. Joseph, good to have you with us here on the broadcast. Thank you. You're welcome. We are now available in your country. Download the app now. Get all the news on the move.